If I can have your attention, we would, I would like to introduce our luncheon speaker. Uh, I'm Arthur Kerman. Bill Walmeyer is someone who, in the proverbial phrase, doesn't need any introduction because uh, almost all of us have had something to do with him over the last 30 years or longer. <laughs> uh, he, uh, we we're really pleased to uh, hear that he had uh, had positive enough feelings about LNS to come to uh, this celebration and to give us a little talk about his interaction with us. Uh, he tells me that before he went to the DOE 30 years ago, uh, he was the director of the accelerator division at Mura, which is uh, something that goes way to the distant past. If I remember right, it was an organization that was supposed to design some accelerators. Uh, uh, but he's been at the DOE since, uh, since 1962 and the head of high energy physics uh, basically all that time. And of course, uh, uh, not since 1962, because four years ago or five years ago, he became president of SURA, the Southeastern University's Research Association. And I've had some uh, uh, interactions with him recently because of CBAF. Uh, but during the time he was at DOE, uh, we always looked to him to make the right decisions about the physics. And uh, as I said, I'm very happy that he agreed to come and address us. And uh, without further ado, Bill Walmeyer. Thank you, Art. I didn't know I was supposed to say good things about LNS. That wasn't what Lee Grodd, he didn't give me that condition. Uh, yeah, Lee called me some time ago, and, and though I, I really can't speak, and you'll find that out later, uh, I'm always weak and say yes when somebody calls me early enough. Uh, Lee's always been in front of me for many years. Uh, he and I uh, were at Purdue together, and even though he's younger than I, he was working on his PhD while I was still working on my master's. Uh, also, uh, uh, one of our colleagues in the physics department uh, taking uh, pity on the poor graduate students, or male, her male graduate, fellow graduate students in the physics department, uh, got us together for a Coke date with some of her sorority sisters. And though I thought I was pretty fast in calling one of the young ladies, Lee had already uh, uh, had a date with her by the time I called. Fortunately, she did reluctantly schedule me in, too, and she's my wife of the day. But anyway, as I say, I heard Vicki this morning talk about the fact that as you get older, the years get shorter. And by gosh, they get shorter. Other things that happen, of course, is it's really true what they say. It gets so you can't remember names. And, Art Kerman and I were going through something about the first name and then the last name begins with a K, et cetera, and that kind of thing. But one of the, one of the difficulties I've had and uh, problems I've had is that I get older, it gets later and later before I start trying to prepare what I'm going to say. Uh, as, a condition, as a result of that, I've, I've, I've well passed the point towards uh, uh, I won't be prepared for this talk until sometime next week, as you'll find. But a few words anyway. Uh, Lee uh, and, and, and the program committee uh, gave me a title of LNS Through the Eyes of the Funders. And I said, well, that sounds OK. Uh, I'm taking that to mean uh, the view from uh, a former DOE program office uh, of the DOE. And therefore, I would apologize to my friends, particularly uh, which I've been more interacting with in recent years than before in nuclear physics, and that most of what I'll talk to will relate to experiences in high energy physics. Though certainly, uh, LNS is even more a nuclear physics lab uh, at the present time, certainly in terms of funding, than, than it is high energy physics. Uh, Sam Ting must be quiescent or something. But anyway, the, 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 for example, the current funding in 92, I'm told, for uh, nuclear physics at LNS is some 16 million, uh, while in high energy physics is somewhat less than 10. 
Still, by the way, in each program, uh, the largest university contractor of, uh, of all, uh, both in nuclear physics and in high energy physics. Anyway, uh, I have a few words here of uh, uh, the program office is working at the interface between science and government. I have in that position in the past been privileged to walk among the giants on both sides of that interface. And I would say I've, I've done my best and haven't been squashed too badly by their feet. Uh, but many of those giants indeed uh, have trod the paths of LNS. The people of great stature, people of dedication and commitment, highest quality, always willing to give themselves fully in the interest of the program in science. I can't recall in all the many years that indeed I did have the program office for high energy physics at DOE that I asked somebody to serve on a committee to do something for the program that they said anything but yes. Uh, it, 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 it's hard to believe, but it, it's indeed true. That's the kind of people that are in the field. And I, I must say that my colleagues at that time in the uh, funding agency were very much the same. Though the government has, government worker gets uh, uh, bad marks from, certainly from presidential candidates. Uh, the ones that I worked with I found of outstanding commitment and indeed high capability. Uh, it, uh, I, I think part of that, of course, was associated with the program that both not only the scientists, but also the government employees agreed that, agreed that it was indeed a most worthwhile and meaningful effort in which to be involved. Uh, I, well, I could have covered that. How about that? I'd like to say just a few marks, of course, remarks about uh, the federal support for science. The federal government became a major player in the support of science and basic research after World War II, and coincidentally, the beginning of LNS, 1946. Uh, I've, of course, puzzled maybe why. Uh, some of the things I think are obvious. It's a recognition of the importance and the great contributions that the academic community made to the war effort, things such as some very close to here, the radar, proximity fuse, nuclear power, other things. Uh, and indeed, as uh, I, I think we learned earlier, uh, uh, Bruno Rossi, Vicky Weiskopf, Gerald Zacharias, and Martin, no, not Martin Deutsch. Martin was here well before he may have returned, but uh, uh, well before the uh, 46. In fact, I learned today, well, I won't tell Martin. Martin's been here quite a while. Uh, from uh, the uh, Los Alamos uh, effort to uh, start work here uh, at that time, in 46. Uh, the other thing is, I think the federal establishments recognized that the U.S. was most fortunate in World War II to have been able to draw on the European science and scientists for our effort here. The other thing is, is that the federal government is the most appropriate place, and that's been recognized certainly very strongly in recent administrations, most appropriate place to support basic research. Uh, the payoff of basic research, I think we're all well assured, is, is well assured. We all know it's well assured, but where and when is too uncertain for a private industry. And then, of course, there was, a, there was a major shock in 1957 with the launching of Sputnik to the U.S., who thought that clearly uh, we would do that first. And I, even when I joined the uh, AEC in uh, uh, June of 62, I could still see the funding effect of that. Uh, going through the system. Uh, the agencies for support of this uh, during these years uh, 
where uh, the, uh, the Department of Defense, in particular ONR, which was a most outstanding and superb organization for the support of research, uh, those defense uh, uh, agencies uh, primarily pulled out of the support of basic research in about the mid-60s with the Mansfield Act. Uh, then the other support, of course, has been from uh, uh, the Atomic Energy Committee, was with from the Atomic Energy Commission, most appropriate in high energy and nuclear physics, since most of the people who wanted to work in that area, uh, many of the people who wanted to work in that area came from the Manhattan Project. And then I think it was about 1951, uh, the start with about $150,000, as I recall, uh, the start of the National Science Foundation as the first, uh, and I guess still the only, uh, dedicated science support, trans uh, entirely support agency. Uh, I've got lots of time, haven't I? Okay, uh, well, I will try to go th through this. So that I, 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 your pleasant, the pleasant part has, you've had with your meal, of course. So uh, I'll show you a few biographs. Uh, Let's see, just a second, and say a few words about them. As a background for a few comments I want to make, I hope the background's not too long. I'll try to shorten it. As I said, as I told Art, I hadn't really, I didn't know how long I'd talk because I hadn't prepared to talk. Uh, as a background for a few remarks I want to make about, uh, thank you, it's a big switch in the camera. As all of you know, hydrophysics is an exploratory science uh, which is at the forefront of science and technology and for a, a understanding of the most fundamental nature of matter and energy. Uh, it pushes the frontier of each, the science and the technology. And uh, since the beginnings of LNS, you've heard some and you'll hear more there have been fantastic advantage, excuse me, advances in knowledge and understanding which have been made in high energy and nuclear physics and cosmology uh, during, this, during this time, and not all before, which can possibly be, of course, discussed uh, at this, uh, at this uh, meeting. Uh, some characteristics of the research which I've noted is that it's and this holds fairly much for nuclear as high energy, not quite as much because it's not quite as cohesive. Uh, high energy is very cohesive and strongly focused in this direction by the fact it's trying to find out the most fundamental uh, bits about matter and energy and the methods of study which require very large machines or very few machines and, and therefore you, you, you all have to work together to get, you have to decide which one you're going to get and you have to work hard to get it because it's also very expensive and hard to get. It's sort of a bootstrap science in my way of thinking in that experiment advances theory, uh, requires advances in technology which permits advance in the experiment, et cetera. Very strong international effect. Uh, the first point I've noted uh, I saw it expressed well before, I, and I can't remember the words. You have, as you all know, uh, very open and friendly cooperation and collaboration and very fierce competition and fighting. And this works, this works not only in the international arena, and we've been seeing some of it in recent years, uh, but it also works individual scientists to individual scientists, group to group, school to school, lab to lab. But somehow it works well to help advance the, the field. And the long lead time nature, this, this graph, this chart undoubtedly is a little old because I think it's much more than three to five years from a research proposal to publication and much more than eight to 10 years uh, from construction proposal to experimental use. Uh, as I recall, the SSC, for example, was first uh, decided as something that uh, higher energy physics should go up on June, the, July the 12th, 1983, which is already nine years ago. Uh, well, I'll never get through if I don't go faster than this, excuse me. So, the, uh, 
issues and problems. Long lead times, therefore, long range planning is very crucially important. Uh, funding stability uh, is uh, very difficult to get, uh, particularly in uh, these days, though we have more funding stability in science than many parts of the uh, uh, national effort, which is funded by the national program. Uh, worldwide competitive position, well, the, uh, certainly the U.S. has come from a commanding leadership position to a sharing leadership position. That's not all bad, it seems to me. Some of it's quite good. Uh, new technology development, as we said before, is important for permitting the advances in accelerators and detector capability that are needed for the field to advance. The structure of the national program, uh, DOE acts as the executive agent or the lead agency, therefore bears special responsibility for long-range planning, for a balanced national program, and for trying to maintain the U.S. Uh, in, a, uh, in a world, uh, uh, at least a sharing world leadership role. Uh, DOE has, has since, I've been there in 62, uh, in its predecessor agencies, IRTA and AEC, provided over 90% of the federal support. In the early days, when I was there in, in the early 60s, uh, much of that other uh, five to ten, seven to ten percent came out of the defense agencies, uh, shifting in about the mid 60s. That uh, shifted in the mid 60s towards the NSF, and of course, and for a long time, it's been entirely the National Science Foundation. The uh, crucial thing that's been true of the program since the since it was initiated was the first standing committee, advisory committee, HEPAP, in 67. Okay, the role of the universities, you well know, uh, role of leadership, uh, role of doing most of the experiments, theory, and, and, and training the new people. The, one of the responsibilities of, of the DOE as the lead agency, as I said, was a, a balancing of the, uh, the program and the factors in, in, in the balancing, of course, uh, is a good balance between utilization, between uh, construction for the next phase, uh, and, and for advanced technology R&D in order to prevent the to go farther than that to get the machines that are needed beyond that. The structure of the DOE program uh, is, uh, of course, three large labs, a large number of experimental users, uh, many theorists, and the uh, much advancement, uh, much involvement in advanced technology development, primarily at the national laboratories. Uh, the other agency supporting this, of course, is the National Science Foundation. Their support is essentially all to universities, uh, and uh, they support users, they support theory, uh, and they support the, uh, uh, what's called the, the uh, University Laboratory at Cornell, but of course is, is also a national laboratory, CSER. Uh, though the Department of Energy supports dollar-wise uh, well over 90% of the program, the National Science Foundation supports approximately one-third of the university support needed for the program. The major objectives of the department are hopefully obvious and hopefully the same as the programs. A high-quality, productive program with diversity and flexibility to operate the, pro the facilities reliably, uh, to construct the new ones as needed, to develop the technology needed to extend the capabilities uh, to help maintain the U.S. in a, in a competitive uh, world position. A summary of the program philosophy is shown here, where the ideas and proposals are generated 
from the ground up by the scientists in, in the field, the agency uh, with input from the field and with input from its advisory mechanisms uh, <clears throat> establishes the policy plans, uh, tries to get the money and budgets. Uh, the uh, laboratory management or the university principal investigator has the responsibility for the day-to-day -day management and uh, the latter I put on some time ago for DOE. The, an important function of the program office at its interface position, I'm not going to go through this, but just to show the complexity of it, uh, is to try indeed to get the funding for the program. And this is, this is for all programs. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's so lengthy, it's so complex, one wonders that, that the money ever comes out at the end or it even matches the needs. But you start from the individual physicists through their, their lab or university organization, uh, and each time, of course, it gets consolidated and, 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 uh, and integrated with other, and then, you go, then that, that, those individual programs go to uh, uh, in, in the high energy physics uh, office, and it's worked on there using HEPAP and others and all kinds of advice. Goes on up through the DOE system, recognized by, uh, represented by that dotted box, up to the Office of Management and Budget. It bounces back and forth, by the way, at each of those parts. Uh, uh, as you fight and as they cut and as you fight to, to restore and that kind of thing. Goes up to Office of Management and Budget, which gets some advice and some sometimes effective under a guy who's presently a consultant and working with me at Sura, Hugh Lowett. Uh, he worked very closely uh, with the uh, President's Science Advisor's Office, and it was quite effective. And I think that still carries on up to the President, over to the, the Congress, where there's, of course, a House and Senate, and there are three types of committees there, uh, one in each, 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 each arm. Uh, there's a budget committee, which decides how much in general should go split. You take the total for the nation, you split that amongst all the various categories. And then there's the authorization committee, which hasn't been very effective and very active recently for Department of Energy. And then you have the appropriations committees that really have to decide how much money you get and it comes down. Then that all comes back down the same way. Okay. Uh, the, uh, let's see, I'd like to show a few budget graphs here because they certainly relate they really relate to LNS in a number of ways. Uh, here's a pretty one, a little old, only goes out to fiscal 90, uh, which shows construction, excuse me, operating in blue, equipment in red, and green is construction. And uh, the Weisskopf years as chairman of the Higher Energy Physics Advisory panel were 67 uh, to 74, there to there, followed by the drill years from 74 to 82, uh, followed by the Sandwise years up to uh, 87, then Francis Lowe came on uh, from 87 to 90, and now it's Stan Wojcicki. Uh, Vicky had, though Vicky started out in a rather affluent or seemingly a relatively affluent area, he had a most difficult job. Uh, he not only had to set the rules and set the precedents uh, for HEPAP, but he also had to deal with the fact that first the budget was growing, he put the uh, HEPAP put together a very extensive study group, all kinds of subcommittees. It took uh, 18 months uh, to come out with a very thorough, comprehensive report on where high energy physics should be going and what it should be doing. I still have several copies. They're very, uh, they're very good. Unfortunately, as you if you take a look at 69, this is fiscal 69. And so actually, if you take a look at calendar 69, you're really dealing more like uh, with fiscal 71, 70, 71. Uh, the budget, things that happen. We're in the, we're in the uh, 
I guess, the Vietnam War. Uh, I can still remember uh, one specific thing that happened to my program. As I recall, it was about November. The appropriations had already been happened, had already happened. And uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, told Wilbur Mills that uh, uh, he wanted an extra tax to get a little extra money to help carry out both guns and butter. And Wilbur said, uh, well, let's see you cut the budget first. He did cut the budget. As I recall, higher energy physics itself lost $10 million that had already been appropriated. And then Wilbur didn't give him the taxes either. Uh, but uh, from that time, which was therefore fiscal, that would have been about fiscal 70, fiscal 69 or 70, uh, particularly if you look at the operating represented by the blue line, there was a slide in the support. And uh, that, by the way, that wasn't just high energy, it was for, that was for all of science. So, uh, Vicky had, and, and HEPAP had to deal with this. And here's a graph I, I, you're going to be lost with, but I like it because it says a lot of things. And let me point to a few. <clears throat> the green line here is CEA, for example. And this, I've, I've, uh, th this is the, uh, each line represents the total funding support to that laboratory during that period. I mean, all separate, there's no integration here. Uh, you have the uh, Fermi Lab growing here. Uh, you have, uh, as I say, the CEA terminating here, PPA terminating about a year earlier. Uh, you have, uh, and remember, this is Vicky in here from about this period to about, uh, about this period. So you have all these accelerators here that are coming on and terminating, and you end up here at the end of this period with three laboratories. Fermi, well, sorry, Fermi Lab. Uh, this is the Brookhaven AGS. The green here is SLAC. And down here is a ZGS that we managed to keep operating by three more, two, three more years by seeing how important it was to do uh, polarized proton studies. Uh, the, uh, but anyway, I, I wanted to sh show that, even though it's difficult to understand, to show that in this, in, this, in this bulge that you saw here, the time from the bulge to the time when it was really going down, that was when Vicky was, was chairing the HEPAP. And, and that was when HEPAP got tremendous uh, it, I, I, was, I was told that it was the most respected government advisory committee in all of Washington. And, and a, a major reason why that was true, it was that by the mechanism of HEPAP and the credibility, the mechanism being that people had a forum, they could, they could argue their case, they thought fairly, we could shut down machines in a, in a rather straightforward way. So there was a, there was a lot of credibility given to HEPAP uh, and that this was done and was able to do this in a responsible way. I, th I think that's a good part of why they, they had that uh, credit. Okay. Uh, I just show this to show a longer history that goes to today's funding uh, in high energy physics. Uh, it shows that uh, in fiscal 93, the budget which isn't determined yet and which isn't going to go up, it's going to go down. Now, this does not include the SSC. I did show some, well, I won't go back to it. I did show some things for the SSC on, on, the, last, on the last one. The, the marks that you see uh, here, 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 and, and up to about here represents the SSC funding on top of the uh, high energy physics. Uh, so this budget, which is uh, this particular one, which goes all the way back to 1960, not back to LNS time, uh, but uh, shows that there's about $620 million total in fiscal 93 dollars uh, in, fis in, in, in fiscal 93, which is a decrease in effect. Now, the nuclear physics program, their records, they don't graph back as far, but they go back to 77. Uh, you can see some of the problems uh, that Bates is going to have, or is having, 
and some of the problems the nuclear physics program is having, if, if you pay attention to uh, the uh, operating, uh, it, it, it goes up to here, and this is a new operating for uh, CBAF. And so you see, even with the new operating for CBAF, that the operating level, which, the, which pays for operations and includes research, uh, in, t in terms of constant value dollars, is certainly going down in 93 at the, at the highest funding that, that nuclear physics will have. And that's, that's a large part, of course, because of the major construction that's taking part in that program, both at CBAP and RIC, and indeed uh, in, a, in a much smaller scale, but a very significant scale, also just completing uh, with the Bates uh, uh, upgrade. upgrade. Uh, with what is the SHR, the South Hall ring. Okay, uh, I'll just show this to you for curiosity. Uh, this is the total uh, uh, manpower supported by high energy and nuclear physics. Uh, the orange represents uh, the manpower in the universities uh, with PhDs and graduate students, and the top is a similar thing for, uh, for, for laboratories. See, you did say I had to uh, 2.30? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, okay, there's a critical need for new facilities since we have an exploratory science. Uh, and since uh, what we're doing in this science is the only way we advance is being able to operate in a new physical domain. And how do you get into a new physical domain? Uh, you get into, of course, uh, a new uh, accelerator capability or a new cosmic ray capability or uh, uh, neutrino detectors, what have you. Uh, for that, uh, so uh, at the present time, the world's accelerators in terms of luminosity and center of mass. The U.S. plans, at least, still keep us. I've got a red check by all the U.S. machines. Uh, and the U.S. plans with the SSC uh, and the Tevatron upgrades all keep, us, keep us indeed competitive on a machine capability. Uh, the World Accelerator Laboratories, of course, are the ones here in the U.S. You have the ones you know of. Western Europe, Germany, Soviet, uh, excuse me, Russia, uh, Japan, PRC. Uh, then you have uh, an increasing importance being given to non-accelerator laboratories, which we have two in the U.S., the one in an old iron mine up in Minnesota and the one in a salt mine uh, in Ohio, Grand Sasso, of which several people here have experiments, uh, Baksan in the Soviet Union, and Kamiokande. Well, as you all know, international collaboration is an extremely important part of both high energy and nuclear physics. Uh, and it's, it's worked very well, I think. Uh, we indeed have our fights between the different parts of the world, but I view it like a family. The family members are all still concerned about the overall health of the family. Uh, they may squabble, uh, but uh, they still have the same goals. They still work together on most things. Long-range planning is extremely important in this field since it's dominated by these large research facilities and long lead times uh, and very expensive facilities. Long-range planning is essential. Fortunately, we have a long and good history of this, going back formally to the NSF panels in uh, uh, 1954 and 56. The General Advisory Committee, President's Science Advisory Committee, pan committee panels of Peori and Ramsey, National Academy of Science committees uh, coming out of uh, 
this, this uh, National Academy of Science panel under Paik in 1964, initiated in 64, published in 66. The elementary particle subpanel was under Bob Walker of Caltech. Uh, we wrote a policy for national action in high energy physics. Uh, Paul Reardon did a major part of that writing, Ray Fricken, and I contributed some. Uh, and that was the vehicle whereby uh, we got the, uh, certainly one major vehicle whereby we got Fermilab. A story about that, of course, a story about that, of course, is that uh, uh, Bob Walker had, his subpanel had finished a study of uh, elementary particle physics and made it a recommendation, to, oh, uh, certainly by November of 1964. And frankly, well, you know, in, 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 in science, plagiarism is a very bad thing. In the government, it's not. Quite the contrary, it's a very good thing. Why should you try to generate something that may well come up second rate when you can pull from this guy and this guy and this guy and have the best? And so what Paul did, what we did, uh, was we cribbed entirely off of, off of uh, Bob Walker's, oh, Paul's not here, huh? uh, we cribbed entirely off of, of, of Bob Walker's report and put it in there. And uh, of course, uh, along with other things, and Bob, I don't think, ever completely forgave me because the Academy was very slow publishing then. It's not too fast now, but very slow then. They didn't publish it till May of 1966, so it looked like he cribbed off of us. Uh, then uh, one I would like to relate to is, is we have a many, uh, I don't, they're not all here, because we have many HEPAP subpanels. HEPAP itself is kind of a, uh, for what is keeping the program that's, that's, that's here good and, and reliable. It's not the best to look at the long-term future of the program where you may want to shut down some of those labs instead of keeping them going uh, medium well. Uh, and so for that purpose, one used these new facility subpanels, the so-called Woods Hole subpanels, the first one of which Vicky chaired uh, almost immediately after he was, uh, became not, uh, no longer the chairman of HEPAP itself in 1974. And at that time, if, I, uh, if you recall what was on the funding graph, the construction, new construction had gone down to zilch, zero. Nothing for new construction. Okay, that 1974 subpanel chaired by Vicky, followed by the 1975 one chaired by Francis Lowe, uh, coupled with a report we wrote that talked about long-term strategy for the, for the national program uh, was what carried through on what Vicky and his panel called the three-prong approach. Higher energy and proton-proton collisions, higher energy and uh, electron-positron uh, uh, collisions, and higher energy and, and proton fixed target. And, and that indeed uh, led to the, the, the Tevatron uh, one and two, led to uh, PEP, uh, and uh, well, Tevatron 1 and 2 gave you both, of course, both, of course, colliding beam and fixed target. And also, it seems like it led to something else. Oh, Isabel. Uh, the, uh, okay, so I've alluded to it. The next thing is then how is DOE advised? Primary advice since 67, indeed, has been from HEPAP. Uh, HEPAP was, uh, first meeting was in January of 1967. One reason it wasn't earlier than that is that we had already decided we wanted the HEPAP. We knew who we wanted as chairman, and that chairman in his wisdom said he wanted to make sure that DOE selected the site for Fermilab before HEPAP got started, so HEPAP didn't get blamed for what DOE did. And so when the site was selected in December of 1966 by Atomic Energy Commission, uh, the, uh, the meeting was followed soon after. The first three or four meetings were all held uh, at, at uh, the chairman's prerogative uh, here uh, at MIT. And, uh, and set, set the tone, set the, the method by which HEPAP operated. And uh, HEPAP was, uh, was used as a model though many variations for subsequent standing advisory committees to nuclear physics, fusion, material science. 
Uh, of course, uh, the program uses, as many of you as individuals know, uh, uses uh, many other mechanisms and HEPAP and, and, and standing committees and advisory committees. There's also laboratory advisory committees. There's ad, ad hoc groups. And, and there also are many telephone calls that I'm sure uh, many of you have received over the years from the various program people at DOE and at NSF. The, uh, I'll skip that. Okay, the indicators of a successful program, uh, the ability to explore beyond the frontier of knowledge, which requires those things, discovery of new knowledge, deeper understanding of the world, physical world, national and international recognition, awards and Nobel Prizes, President Science Medal, etc. And the program's done fairly well by that too. And I think we can say that LNS has done quite well by not only, certainly by the, by the Nobel Prizes, not only uh, of, of its faculty, but also its, its students, but also on many other prizes, uh, Fermi Awards, uh, President's uh, Science Award, uh, uh, you, you name them, uh, staff members of this uh, laboratory have had them. So the summary is that it's a exceeding exciting, exciting field, exceedingly exciting field. Uh, the, uh, it's becoming exceedingly interesting, the connections between elementary particles and cosmology. Uh, and the future is bright for more than technology. Uh, let's see, I have a couple more view graphs, but before that I wanted to get back up and just talk a while. Essentially, in all of the things, all aspects which might be considered important to high energy and nuclear physics program, programs, the LNS has made truly seminal contributions. You've heard many this morning. You'll hear many more in the rest of the meeting, and some, I'm sure, will be forgotten to be covered. Physics, theory and experiment, education and training and the quality and achievements of the graduate students. I wonder how many graduate students have come out of here. I suppose you know, or, uh, but there must be a, 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 a fantastic number that uh, spread throughout the world. Not a whole lot of emphasis has been given on it, but there's been a lot of accelerated work here, uh, both in R&D and construction and design, operations and research. Uh, the early cyclotron, the 320 MeV electron synchrotron, the Cambridge Electron Accelerator, the development of the strong focusing principle, which Livingston was a significant contributor to, along with Courant and uh, Snyder, Bates. Uh, let me, I'd like to, I, I don't see it on the program. Let me say just a little bit about the CEA story. Uh, back uh, the, in, let's see, 1949, I guess it was, the uh, cyclotron, synchrocyclotron at uh, uh, Harvard was completed. And uh, not too long after that, in 52, Ramsey was pushing that there needed to be higher energy around this region. He got together with Zacharias and Livingston in early 52, uh, and they agreed on a joint effort towards, the, towards a, a new accelerator in the Cambridge area. Uh, uh, by April of, of uh, 52, Stan Livingston, who was indeed a professor here, uh, since indeed 38, uh, got tried, got, uh, uh, sought funding from Stratton as vice president for, of MIT, and, and sought people to help with a design study from Lee Hayward, then 
uh, the uh, director of Brookhaven and, and wanted to go towards the, the design of a 10 GeV proton synchrotron. Uh, well, a compromise, he went to Brookhaven that summer and uh, during the next very few months, together with Courant and Snyder, developed a strong focusing principle, which has had a major effect, certainly on, on particle and nuclear physics, but also on many other things throughout the world. Uh, certainly one of the immediate things it has is that CERN raised, CERN, which came over shortly after this, raised their sights from a 10 GeV machine to the 28 GeV machine they, they, they built. The AGS uh, raised their sights to a 30 GeV machine and actually got approval to build that in 1954, just less than two years later. Uh, I, I was fascinated by this. The paper uh, on the subject was published still that same year in P uh, Fizrev 88 in 1952, the Krant, Livingston, and Snyder paper. Uh, okay, then uh, uh, Stan went, came back here and, and kept working on proposals, put in a 10 to 20 GeV proton synchrotron proposal to the AEC in October of 52, put in a 15 BeV proton synchrotron proposal in August of 53. He ran into trouble in that the GAC, the General Advisory Committee to the uh, AEC had said that multi-BEV machines, they were going of course on a pretty strong focusing principle, uh, should only be at, at national laboratories. Uh, he switched to, in March of 54, he switched to a 6 GeV electron synchrotron, proposed it in August of 54 to the AEC, waited in 55 while the PPA, Mura, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, and others put in proposals for machines. And uh, what will you believe? But the Congress, on its own, I'm sure there was no influence from here, inserted $10 million for two university accelerators uh, in the AEC budget in, uh, in the spring of 54. Uh, there was a letter that went out from uh, AEC to the presidents of many universities uh, in July of 55, saying get to me in three to six months uh, a proposal if you want to build an accelerator uh, less than or equal to $5 million. Uh, this was, uh, uh, even when I came to AEC in 1962, I heard of this, this was known as a box top contest there. Uh, anyway, uh, CEA and PPA won that box top contract uh, uh, and CEA signed the letter contract in April of 56. Uh, first it was thought to be $7.9 million, eventually completed uh, in 1962 for $11.5 million. Uh, but a fascinating story, I think, on, on uh, the, uh, indeed, the initial initiative of, of Ramsey, and Ramsey stayed involved uh, all the time, uh, but also uh, very much work on the part of uh, uh, Stan Livingston, uh, an LNS uh, professor and the director of the CEA. Uh, the Bates story I learned a little bit about today even. Uh, Bates, of course, uh, started construction in 66, and I was wondering who, how it got started, and I understand it got started by uh, Peter Demos, as you say, and opened his big mouth, and that uh, they were sitting around uh, with Sergeant Bartosi and so forth uh, about uh, uh, what could they do next, and he said, well, how should, maybe we should build a new machine, and he said they took him up on it. Uh, so coming out of that was the Bates machine, which has done much good research, is, is just completing a, a very major upgrading and, and should do uh, much more. Okay, the pattern recognition device, uh, Pepper, Pless, Rosenson, I remember in particular, help, much help here from on computer development, detectors, many, much detector work coming here. One of the things, uh, I said that uh, MIT received more support in higher geophysics than any other university. But many universities receive significant levels of support. And one of my observations was when the level of support got to be a certain size, uh, there would be a spallation and there'd be a, a, a new group would form, a new leadership. And so much of the research that carried out was much with the same statistics. But I, I observed that a lot of the work that's been done in this laboratory has been of a larger scale and it certainly, I think, has paid off uh, for the laboratory. Uh, certainly uh, in detectors, the world's largest 
was, was, was uh, under the direction of Sam Ting here, uh, a most fabulous uh, thing, and, and under the administrative direction of Fred Epling, and, and significant part from him. Policy and advice, well, I, I guess I've said all I should say at this time about HEPAP. Uh, certainly, Vicki uh, was, was a, a major influence on the U.S. program, uh, and uh, uh, Francis Lowe and Sid Drell, who uh, is, is certainly associated with this laboratory, too. HEPAP subpanels I've talked about, NSAC, uh, much, much, of course, policy and advice from Herman Feshbach, from Art Kerman, uh, particularly in the nuclear physics field. Program funding, uh, let me cut this a bit, but I do want to read something from the first contract they could find for me out at uh, uh, DOE. It was uh, the term of the contract was April 1, 1958, to and including January 31st, 1959. It was for $1.4 million. That compares with today's 20, uh, what was it, 26, 27 million dollars? 26, yeah. Uh, and uh, I want to read a bit on the scope of work. Uh, the contractor shall in good faith uh, do the best of its ability and know-how and accordance, et cetera. Uh, conduct eight separate programs of research in nuclear physics, which are identified as followed. Scope one, cosmic ray search uh, under the direction of, of Rossi. Uh, scope two, high energy accelerator physics research under Bernie Feld. Scope three, bubble changer research under uh, R. Williams. Uh, scope four, linear accelerator research under Bill Botosi. Uh, scope five, uh, ONR nuclear energy level studies under Buchner. Uh, uh, scope six, radioactivity and cyclotron research under Martin Deutsch. And theoretical research under Weisskopf and Rockefeller generator program under uh, uh, Scharenberg, all of it under the overall direction of Martin Deutsch. And just so you think that bureaucratic effects weren't involved then, uh, under Article 4 personnel, there's a phrase that says, provided, however, that there shall be subject to the written approval of the commission, reimbursement for salaries in excess of $15,000 per year. Uh, the, uh, so uh, salaries more than 15 had to be approved directly by the commission. The recent renewal of this contract uh, was, uh, which has accumulated all the funding over all this, these, this, this period, uh, added to uh, somewhere between uh, 410 and 450 million dollars. So a little bit of money here. Well, it's like Dirksen used to say, a billion here and a billion there, and pretty soon you've got real money. In research, a million here and a million there, and pretty soon you've got real money. Uh, so uh, in program funding, uh, LNS has certainly helped the program, the national program. They've also done uh, very well uh, themselves, but with what they're putting out, of course, indeed, what they, what they get funded for. Uh, international collaboration, uh, I'm sorry, let's see. Uh, Throughout the entire faculty, things that certainly stand out very much in my mind, though, is Vicky, truly an internationalist. Of course, he was the director general of CERN, 61 to 66. Sam Ting, uh, the, the work he did at, with Mark J at Daisy, the work of the L3 at CERN. Uh, I, you know, I watched Sam and that L3, and whenever he ran into money troubles, he'd first come to us, Hildebrand, very reluctant to give money to anybody, it seems. Uh, so he'd go off and pull in another collaborator. And you know, uh, fantastic uh, uh, negotiations he must have had having the PRC, the Soviet Union, uh, the uh, Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the US. Uh, so, uh, Okay, I have to, uh, it, actually when we were having lunch, I'd forgotten one thing that LNS contributed, and that's a government leader. Uh, one of my bosses at the department, in fact, the first boss at the Department of Energy, uh, John Deutsch uh, from MIT came on 
to nominally head up the Office of Energy Research, but in fact, uh, with uh, Schlesinger spending most of his time in the White House, John, uh, from our viewpoint, ran the Department of Energy. Uh, and John and I had good and bad interactions. When he first came on, he planned to fire me, but uh, my good friend Sid Drell <laughs> talked him out of it. Uh, later, he told me, he said, Wallamari, you're the second best program direct manager in all of DOE. I said, oh. I was reluctant to ask him who was first. And he told me Admiral Rickover. Uh, a couple of years after that, I, I, I had uh, uh, Ed Kentner, who had headed up the, the uh, fusion program, came up to me and said he'd met John Deutsch. And John Deutsch had told him that he was the third best program manager in all of DOE. I said, oh, well, he's consistent. Uh, the, uh, I, I, want, I like to show those two view graphs, and I'm finished. Uh, another question is, what did I do with them? Oh. Uh, this is the picture of uh, Stan Livingston, uh, Courant, and Snyder, and also John Blewett at the time of the uh, strong focusing principle uh, discovery and development. And Things have, I think, gone well for the Department of Energy, for high energy and nuclear physics, and for LNS. But now you can take this, this says the air is clean, the food is nutritious, and we've got inflation licked. We can go on like this forever. <laughs> now, whether that's a caution or whether that's, that's praise depends upon what time you think that came in the dinosaur, uh, uh, dinosaur uh, uh, heritage. After all, they lived on Earth for what, millions and millions and millions of years, much longer than, than, than we have been. On the other hand, they are extinct now. <laughs>